introduce you and you won't get another uh, you won't get an opportunity this actually time. yes i <laughs> will friends and family day at parkway where uh, i am <laughs> i get to introduce him Thankful you're coming. I uh, have a lot of students here, and I really appreciate that. Really thank you for showing up and other visitors. We appreciate you being a part of this. Before we start, let's have a brief word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this opportunity that we have to come together and consider your word. We're thankful for the lectures this week, and we pray that we'll do much good not only this week, but in the weeks to come. Please bless each person that is here, and please forgive us of our sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Amos chapter 8 is where our text is taken from this morning. If you have your device with the Bible on it, if you have your Bible with you, you turn over to Amos 8, and we're going to be looking at verse 11 to begin our, our lesson for the next little while. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, 
but of hearing the words of the Lord. Amos, the prophet that's talking here, describes a situation which is astounding. Jehovah, the Lord, is about to withdraw His prophetic word from His people, Israel. How could that be? Why is this going to happen? Why would He withhold His word from His people? Well, the answer is not difficult to understand. And the present generation needs to pay careful attention. The northern kingdom had basically despised the word from almost its very beginning. The prophets had been opposed. Their messages scorned. And they were told by the people, cease and desist. Have you ever gotten these text messages from these random folks that say, Clyde, you need to consider this. Or, Roger, you need... And this, your name's not Clyde, your name's not Roger. And you're wondering, who is this that's sending me this? You know what I do now? I send back a message that says, cease and desist from sending me any more messages. And then I proceed to block them and delete the message. Well, the people of Israel had told the prophets of God, cease and desist. Quit. Quit speaking to us. Quit preaching to us. As a result of all of that, God would dry up all communication with them. This famine of the Word of God began when Israel rejected the law and it grew worse and worse until God took them into captivity, Assyrian captivity, where they had no prophets, no one, to declare to them His Word. In verse 14 of the chapter that we're looking at, Amos describes where Israel's heart rested. <coughs> they that swear by the sin of Samaria and say, Thy God, O Dan, liveth, and the manner of Beersheba liveth, even they shall fall and will never <coughs> rise up again. One commentator well states it this way, they were so taken up with the false gods that they could no longer hear the word of the true and living God. Hosea, the great minor prophet, tells how Israel sought revelation from idols shortly before its doom. You look at Hosea chapter 4 and Hosea 4.12, the prophet says, My people ask counsel at their stocks and their staff declareth unto them, for the spirit of whoredoms have caused them to err, and they have gone a whoring from under their God. They were looking everywhere and anywhere for a divine word except the one place where they could truly get it. And that was God's word. Idolatry in the northern kingdom had come of age. Burton Kaufman says it this way, the people no longer either recognized or honored the true and almighty God, but instead worshipped and swore by their golden idols. Kaufman then says, added to that was the licentious and abominable worship they practiced there, and if that was not apostasy, there was never such a thing. I agree with you totally. That was total and complete apostasy from God's word. How far they had fallen how tragic their end would be. But how much more tragic is it today that in many churches that exist this hour, this situation exists. The Lord's church needs to heed the message of Amos. And we all need to avoid the end of Israel. If that is to happen, if we're to avoid what happened to Israel, then all of the Dans, all of the Samarians, and all of the Beershebas need to be eliminated. And what do I mean by that? Everything that hinders us today has got to be eliminated. The idols which plague us today must be overthrown, and they are numerous. Now you say, wait a minute. We're not worshiping idols. Yeah, there's American Idol on television, even though, honestly, it's a shell of its former self. Have you seen it lately? 
I mean, you know, when they had the guy on there, you know, that was saying, well, you know, I'm not going to approve. You know, you know the British dude, I can't remember what his name is. When, the, when he left, the, the, the show went like that to me. But that's not what we're talking about, American Idol. We're talking about idols of the heart. Have you ever been to the Parthenon in Nashville, Tennessee? Several of you have. If you've never been, you need to go at least once. Now, you may never get to the Parthenon in Greece, which the ruins of the Parthenon are there. But if you go to Nashville, Tennessee, right there in the heart of Nashville, there is Centennial Park. And in the midst of Centennial Park, there's that great building, the Parthenon. I've been there three times to visit. The first time was when I was in sixth grade, way, way, way back when. We took a field trip to the Parthenon. And it was tremendous to me. I'd never seen anything like it. They had actual artifacts from Greece and Rome. And it made history come to life for me. And there was a great big empty room right in the midst of that building. And they had a diagram of what they planned to put in that room. The plan was to build a replica of the idol Athena and place it right there in that room. And I thought, well, that's going to be big. The second time I visited, many years later... <coughs> That had already been built. And when you went into that room, and I've been there since for a third visit, that big replica of the goddess Athena fills up the entire place. It's amazing to look at. And people back in the days of Amos and Hosea would literally bow down and worship those sculptures. When I was a senior in college back in 1987, we took a trip, me and two friends of mine took a trip to Memphis, Tennessee. Now, if you've been through Memphis, you know about the, the pyramid. Mm -hmm. The big pyramid, you know? That was a new building when I was a senior in college. And it was planned to be used for all sorts of different events. They use it for the NCAA basketball tournament. They use it for uh, concerts or for convention events. And it was brand new at that point. Well, two friends of mine reported for the school paper, the bell tower, and they came up to me one afternoon and said, Dave, are you doing anything right now? I said, not really. He said, you want to go to Memphis with us? Sure, I don't have anything else to do. I don't have any homework to do. Well, we're going to go over there and take pictures of the big statue that they've got on display. The Ramses exhibit had come to town. Now, Ramses was a pharaoh of Egypt way, way back when. Some people think that he might have been the Pharaoh of the Exodus. I don't agree with that, but that's another story. Still, Ramses was a very important Pharaoh. And the biggest stone statue was going to be displayed there in the pyramid. Get it? Egypt, pyramids. Anyway, they were going to have that in the big room there in the pyramid. So I said, sure, I'll go. So we got into a Ford Pinto wagon. Mm. Now, the young folks don't know about a Ford Pinto. Used to be a running joke about a Ford Pinto. If you ran in the back of it, it would explode. Because there were actual things where it would explode if you hit it the right way or the wrong way. We got in this Ford Pinto wagon, and I'm in the back seat with no seat belts, all the way from Henderson, Tennessee to Nashville, and I'm just like this, terrified. Are we going to have a wreck? We didn't. We made it. We go up the escalator when we get inside that building. And the first thing you start seeing is that stone statue. And it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until you come into the main room and it fills up, it seemed like, the entire place. It was that big. It made that much of an impression. And people would bow down to statues like that. That's what we're talking about. And it's not just the big statues. There were small statues, maybe about that small that would be in households, on the mantle, if you will, in a prominent place, and a family would bow down to that tiny little icon. That's where their heart resided. That's where they were in their minds and hearts. Well, we don't have the little icons, and we don't have the big statues, even though Hinduism has its icons. There's a Hindu temple as far as I know, still in Birmingham, Alabama, when I was living up there, they had a big newspaper story about the Hindu temple opening up. This is 1999. Had a picture of the caretaker of the Hindu temple feeding, I get this, feeding food to the icons. Feeding statues. 
I know those statues didn't reach out and grab it needed. He was caring for the idols. We don't have that, or do we? We have idols, and they're numerous. The God of materialism is one of those idols. The God of materialism. Our country is more materialistic than it's ever been. It seems as if keeping up with our neighbors, the Joneses, the Smiths, whoever it might be, is the norm in many places. He's got him a new sports car. I need to get me one. He's got a new house on the lake. Oh, we need to get us a new house on the lake. It's just keeping up and getting more and more stuff. It's also quite evident that this is the kind of thinking among too many brothers and sisters in Christ. <coughs> too much attention is paid to the here and now. What we can get now instead of what we can treasure up for in eternity. Like Solomon of old, some attempt to find happiness in wealth. And as a result, they fail miserably. Have you ever tried to stop and do a calculation of how much wealth Solomon had accumulated? It boggles the mind. You know, Bill Gates, I think, is still the wealthiest person in the world. It may have been transplanted by uh, some other billionaires or trillionaires. But he, for many years, was the top, by bar none, wealthiest man in the United States. You compare his wealth to Solomon, it doesn't even compare. It will boggle your mind to think about how much wealth he accumulated. Of course, that was by the hand of God. But people want to be as wealthy as Solomon, but when they try to find happiness in that, they'll fail miserably every time. Children are neglected. Marriages are wrecked. Friendships destroyed as a result of the pursuit of gold and silver. Instead of providing for one's family, the materialistic person is covetous. And you remember what Paul said in Colossians 3.5 about covetousness? It is idolatry. We can make that money that's in our wallets, and you may have a lot, you may have a little. We can make that money, those plastic cards, our idol, if we're not careful. Materialism causes a person to mistreat his neighbor. Israel was guilty of this. Listen to Amos in Amos 8.4. He says, Hear this, O ye that swallow up the needy, even to make the poor of the land to fail. Whether it's in shady business practice, gambling, or outright deceit, materialism affects other people. It is a repudiation of the golden rule. Matthew 7, 12. Jesus said, Therefore all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do you even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Most importantly, the work of the Lord suffers because of the materialistic person. This person does not give as he should to the cause of Christ. He whines and he moans at the very idea of sacrificial giving. You know what his God's color is? Green. That's the color of his God. Materialism. But another idol which plagues too many people today and in the church as well is the idol of worldliness. Consider the words of Paul in Romans 12 too. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You know, to some folks today, that verse is almost non-existent. You'd be hard-pressed when you look around, when you visit uh, a city or a town or the stores where you go, you'd be hard-pressed to spot a Christian by his or her manner of behavior much less by his clothes. We need to make sure that the way we address ourselves in public it reflects our heart and doesn't draw undue attention to ourselves, but not just what we wear in public, the way we behave in public. Is it as it becomes a Christian or is it something quite different? In the 21st century, America has become a cultural swamp. You know, I hear a lot of things about the swamp. 
clean the swamp, drain the swamp, all that. Whatever you think about that. You can't deny that morally speaking, America has become just that. A swamp. All that is deviant, all that is lurid, all that is decadent is held up as being the norm. Anything that can be sniffed, smoked, injected, or drank is fine. You just want to get a high? You just want to sort of leave this plane of existence and you want to sort of uh, leave it all behind for a while and just uh, have this uh, exorbitant feeling? Go right ahead, we are told. Take that drug, sniff that powder, drink that substance. It'll be okay. That's what we're told. The commercials advertise it as such. You know, you're bombarded with commercials about alcohol all the time. You can't watch a college football game now without being subjected to alcohol commercials. That's the number one drug problem in the United States, folks. It's not cigarettes, as bad as cigarettes are. It's not the hard drugs even, as bad as they can be. It's alcohol. That was the number one drug when I was a student. And it hasn't changed. You know what the number two cause of death in the United States is? Number two, drunk driving. The number two cause. Alcohol-related deaths. That might be a surprise to you, but it is. Number one is smoking-related deaths. Number two is alcohol. That's never talked about. But you see, that's part of the problem. The age of first use is getting younger and younger and younger. Illegitimate births are at an all-time high, and there's nothing said negatively about it. In fact, it's held up now as the norm. That's what young ladies need to aspire to because you have Hollywood superstars and, and stars in uh, music that have their children outside of marriage, and you can't judge them. You can't say anything against them. Who's going to judge them? Well, what does the Word of God say? That's what needs to be asked. And as a result of this looseness concerning morality, sexually transmitted diseases are rampant. We could spend the rest of our time talking about that and the problems that are related to that. But so many of these things have plagued our society. And the sad thing is, Children of God have all too often sunk back into the quicksand of ungodly living. Divorce is all too common these days. You hear the statistics that one out of two marriages end in divorce. That's not quite accurate. It's about oh, 30% when you look at it realistically. But after that, those numbers rise. The more marriages that are taking place, the number of divorces rise. It's a problem in the United States. Unscriptural relationships are not only tolerated, they're even sometimes defended by preachers, by church leaders. Add to all of that families who defend their own instead of defending the truth. And you can see the situation that exists. It can be volatile. Matthew 19.9, the Lord still gives one reason for divorce and remarriage, and that's fornication, sexual immorality. That needs to be upheld. That needs to be preached. But see, what we're talking about in this is that high standards need to be held. We who follow Jesus or who claim to follow Jesus need to hold up ourselves to a higher standard. Jesus says that worldliness comes from the heart. Matthew 15, 18, and 19. So to keep one's life clean, he must keep his heart clean. Replace evil thoughts with godly thoughts, Philippians 4.8. Ungodly clothes need to be replaced with clothes that reflect a Christ-like life, 1 Timothy 2. Now I'm not talking about dressing like a monk, or dressing like a nun, or dressing in a complete burlap sack. You probably don't know what a burlap sack is. Dressing in something that's totally plain and unbecoming. I'm not talking about that. I'm just simply talking about dress that reflects who you are as a child of God. We need to think about that when we go out in public. A third idol that needs to be destroyed is that of false worship. 
The northern kingdom from its very beginning was characterized by a perversion of the plan of God. In 1 Kings 14, 16, we read that Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, did sin and make Israel to sin. Now, how did he do that? In short order, Jeroboam changed the place of worship. He changed it from Jerusalem to Shechem. He changed the object of worship from God to two calves of gold. He changed the priesthood from that of Levi to any other tribe. And the time of worship from the 15th day of the 7th month to the 15th day of the 8th month. You read that in 1 Kings 12, 25-33. In essence, Jeroboam was an ancient change agent. He wanted to bring about change in Israel. <coughs> Though Israel was guilty of false worship, Judah also succumbed to it, the southern kingdom. Consider what Ezekiel the prophet was allowed to see through the prophetic eye. In Ezekiel chapter 8, God permitted him to look into the temple in Jerusalem. What God did was He took Ezekiel by the Spirit. He wasn't literally going to, to Jerusalem. God took him by the Spirit into Jerusalem. His body was at the river Kibar. There was present day Iran. But his, or Iraq. His spirit, however, traveled to Jerusalem. And God allowed him to see inside the temple. What he saw that he describes there in that chapter was astounding. At the northern gate of the temple, there stood an image, an idol of jealousy. On the walls inside the temple of God, there were forms of creeping things, forms of an abominable beasts, and all the idols of Israel portrayed on those walls. That had been forbidden by the law of Moses. And yet Israel had done that. Seventy elders of Israel stood worshiping idols there in the temple. Women were weeping, crying over the god Tammuz. And to top it all off, at the very door of the temple... There were 25 priests that were standing there with their faces toward the sun and they were worshiping the sun. That's in Ezekiel 8, 5-16. Now in the midst of showing all of that, listen to what God told Ezekiel. He said in verse 12, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark? Every man in the chambers of his imagery? For they say, The Lord seeth us not. The Lord hath forsaken the earth. God is telling Ezekiel, look, just look at this. Look at what they're doing. Do you see what they're doing in my name? Do you see what they're doing? He was wanting to call his attention to it. Now, if those people had been asked why they were doing all of that, they undoubtedly would have responded, well, we're being tolerant. We're being spiritual. We're being open-minded. But what did God call it? Abomination. Israel and Judah were both carried away. Why? Because they perverted the Word of God. Well, today, the body of Christ is being plagued by the same kind of thinking. Change agentry, some have called it. I call it the new left in the church. They're motivated by what they say is a higher spiritual. That is to rescue the church from the shackles of sectarianism. They consider the church of the Lord to be just another denomination. And so it must give in to ecu the ecumenical movement. That is, join hands with everyone who pro professes to believe Christ. It doesn't matter what they do in worship. It doesn't matter what they practice as far as the work of the church, the organization of the church, and what they do. It doesn't matter about all that because we're all going the same place. We're all following the same Jesus. Let's join hands in worship. Traditional worship, especially as we engaged in in chapel, they say, well, that's stuffy. That's boring. That's lifeless. And they clamor for innovation. Something new. And those new innovations run the gamut. Clapping hands during singing. 
to full-blown instrumental music, to drama instead of preaching. You name it, it's been promoted and it's been practiced. Further, some churches have even changed the day of taking the Lord's Supper. The New Testament teaches in Acts 20 verse 7 that the disciples came together on the first day of the week to break bread. That is the Lord's Supper. And yet, what do we see? Some are, are taking the Lord's Supper on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, any day besides the Lord's Day. Shades of Jeroboam. Jeroboam changed the day of worship and we're seeing that today. Now these radicals that we're talking about come from an extremist background. And they're reacting to the extremism they grew up in. There are some notable exceptions, but many of them openly speak of their experience and they've swung all the way from one extreme to the other. But the result is quite the same as it was in the Old Testament. Divisiveness. Mean-spiritedness. Condescension toward people that disagree. And these people are eloquent. They're intelligent. And they're charismatic. They utilize their talents to draw away disciples and to teach their doctrines. Those who style themselves after this kind of thought demand change and demand it right now. Otherwise, they say the church will die. I'm not opposed to change if it's the right kind of change. We've got to change if we're sinners. We've got to change our hearts and our lives. We can change things that are incidental that don't mean much in worship to make it more effective and more streamlined. I don't have a problem with changing the order of worship and, and the things that we do as far as uh, the order of things and making things more uh, smooth. But when you start talking about changing over to something that the New Testament doesn't authorize, that's a whole other kettle of fish. The change that's advocated by those that I'm talking about is that which alters divine scripture. Additions, innovations are positively condemned in the Word of God. 1 Corinthians 4, 6 and Revelation 22, 18 and 19 come to mind. That which forbids instrumental music in worship also forbids having a pope. They stand or fall together. The Bible nowhere says thou shalt not have a pope. Do you know that? It doesn't say you will not have a pope. And yet how do we know that the pope is not authorized? Because the Bible says Christ is the head over the body, the church. Christ has all authority, all power in heaven and earth. That means I have none. He has it all. And when somebody purports himself to be the vicar of Christ on earth, the pope of the church, he's doing that which has no authority. How do I know that? Because the Bible positively states who has all authority. Now, the Bible says what we can and must do in worship. And when it comes to the music that we use in worship, He has positively stated it. Sing and make melody in your hearts to the Lord. Ephesians 5.19, Colossians 3.16. The word sing in both of those passages means make music. If He had just said sing and make music, sing and make melody to the Lord, that would have left room for an instrument to be used as an aid. But he specifies the instrument there. Have you noticed that? Ephesians 5, 19. He says, sing and make melody, make music, where? In your heart to the Lord. Amen. That's the instrument. Now somebody might say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. When I play that instrument, I am making music in my heart to the Lord. How can you say I'm wrong? Let's look at it from this angle. All of us agree the Lord instituted the Lord's Supper, right? He said, as, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you show the Lord's death till He come. Now what did He dedicate? He dedicated the bread and the fruit of the vine. Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians 11, doesn't he? This is the body and blood of Christ. It doesn't literally become the body and blood of Christ. That's transubstantiation. And that's nowhere taught in the New Testament. It represents the body and the blood of Christ as we partake as a body. Okay. What if I were to, next Sunday morning in the worship service where in the church where I attend, what if I were to bring a great big old pizza? I love pizza, by the way. I love pizza. It's good pizza. I love it. 
What if I do is bring a big old pizza and put it on the Lord's table right alongside the bread and take a big old two liter cold, you can see the water dripping down off it, it's so cold, make you thirsty. I'm making you thirsty right now, right? And a big old bottle of Coca Cola. I love Coke. Can you tell? I bring a big old bottle of Coca-Cola and sit it down there on the Lord's table and say, okay, now, when we take the Lord's Supper, you can take that bread and that fruit of the vine, but as an aid to you taking it, you can have a piece of pizza and you can have this Coke. Hold on a minute. What's wrong with that picture? Because he specified the bread and fruit of the vine, I cannot then take the pizza and the Coke and add to it. That's just an aid. Okay, let's not go that far. All right. The bread that we have on the Lord's table each Lord's Day is bland in its taste. If you've ever had it, you know what I'm talking about. It's bland. What if I were to bring a big old, bring a big old jar of grape jelly? Welch's grape jelly. And it's cold jelly. Not that the room temperature stuff. It's cold jelly. Put it right there beside that bread. And say, okay, to make your jelly, to make your bread taste better, as an aid, you can take a swap of that jelly and place it on that bread when you eat it. What's wrong with that? The Bible doesn't authorize it. Let me tell you something. The same thing that authorizes putting pizza and Coca-Cola on the Lord's table or putting jelly along with your bread on the Lord's table, the same thing authorizes instrumental music, which is to say it's not authorized. How do I know that? Because the New Testament has nothing to say, period, about worship on earth in the church with instrumental music. It has plenty to say in the Old Testament, no doubt. God commanded it in the temple. For Second Chronicles 29, 25. David talked about it effusively in the Psalms. But we don't go by the Old Testament for what we do in worship. Galatians 5 makes that clear. He says if you go back for one thing, you're bound to do it all. And he says if you go back to the law for your justification, Galatians 5, 4, he says you are fallen from grace. You've literally given up grace. If you justify what you're doing today by the Old Testament, you're in trouble. Now, is the Old Testament inspired? Yes, no doubt. The Bible says it is. Is the Old Testament profitable for us? No doubt. It's for our example, for our learning. Paul says it is. But to go by it for what we do in the church in the New Testament age is to do something that Paul says you can't. So, because of that, we go by the New Testament and what we do in worship. The New Testament has nothing to say about instrumental music. It does positively say we're to sing. We are to use our bodies as a living sacrifice, are we not? Romans 12, 2. And we use the fruit of our lips to make music. I love to play music. If you hang around about 3.30 in the atrium, you'll get to hear me and my uncle and some of my cousins and, and, and uh, this fellow over here sitting on the side. His uh, daddy was in the Country Music Hall of Fame, by the way. Yes. He's good. He can flat out pick. That's Alabama term. He flat out picks the guitar. So you'll get to hear some of us get together and pick and sing. I love it. I love it. Grew up with it. But I have never once, never once brought my bass guitar into any worship setting. Not once. The reason why, there are two kinds of music that are in existence. Vocal music, that's called a cappella. I'll get back to that in a second. And instrumental music. Now, a cappella. You've heard that term a cappella used? You know what that term means, a cappella? In the style of the church. In the style of the church. That's vocal. Why is that? Because for the first 600 years that we know about in church history, not one reference is made to having instrumental music in worship. In the mid-600s, it was introduced for the first time, and it was rejected. It wasn't for another 300 years until about the 900s that it was successfully introduced. And guess what? Your major denominations today, the Baptists, Methodists, Presbyterians, Catholics. Do you know, well, not Catholics, but the rest of those I mentioned. Do you know when they adopted instrumental music in their worship? The late 1800s. Long after the apostolic age. Long after the first century. That should tell us something. Instrumental music was not used widely for the first 1800 years or so following Christ's resurrection, following the church's establishment. That ought to tell us something. The understanding among people in general about it. Why have I taken so much time about this? Because 
So many people are involved in instrumental music as worship, and they're not aware of the fact that it's a relatively recent innovation. And that the New Testament does not authorize it. We've got to go by the New Testament as our authority and not go by the idols of extreme change. Drama as a substitute for preaching falls on that same level. We must preach the gospel. And we need to teach the gospel. But we need to simply realize that all these gods that I've talked about are symptoms. They're symptoms of the larger problem. This larger problem in the church today was the root cause of the apostasy of the northern kingdom the day of Amos. In Hosea 4, the prophet who is a younger contemporary of Amos said in verse 1, The Lord has a controversy with the inhabitants of the land because there is no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. Then he goes on to verse 6 to say, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou be no priest to thee. Seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget your children. This dearth of truth in the land led to Israel's destruction. That was foretold by Amos. And today in our age, the dearth of truth may not only lead to the destruction of our country, I don't think the United States will always exist. We've only been around over 200 years. We're young still, but we could very well collapse. Don't think that it'll always be this way. It not only could lead to the destruction of our nation, it could lead to the destruction of churches that were once faithful. It has happened. It is happening. Now, we can't be like Chicken Little. You remember Chicken Little? Any of y'all young folks know what Chicken Little You remember? What did Chicken Little say? Come on, what Chicken Little say? Sky is falling. Thank you. The sky is falling. Remember? Sky is falling. Sky is falling. Sky is falling. Did anybody pay attention to her? Nope. Remember the little boy who cried wolf? The little boy cried wolf, went into the town and said, Wolf, wolf! And everybody rushed. They went to see where the wolf was. There's no wolf. They went back to town. Later on, he's, Wolf! Wolf! Everybody rushed to see who the wolf was. No wolf. And then it began to not listen to him. And a wolf came. And what did he do? Wolf! Wolf! Nobody reacted. And as a result, the wolf gobbled him up. You can be too reactive to things that don't make a difference. Don't be like that. Don't react in a way that negates the real problem that exists. But neither should we be like an ostrich. An ostrich will bury its head in the sand to keep from seeing the problem. We can't do that and can't be ignorant and indifferent to certain danger. You know, Christianity is a taught religion. Every generation has a responsibility to learn the truth and to obey it. Every generation has a responsibility to teach the truth to the one after. This involves a love for the Word of God, a study of the Word of God, and a proclamation of it without fear. One reason why Israel fell is that she lost that desire. And when she did, according to Amos, God took His Word away. Today, God's Word is taken away when we allow all these things we've talked about to take its place. We've got to be hungering and thirsting for righteousness, as Jesus says in Matthew 5, 6. We've got to always desire the truth of God. As individuals and as churches, we never must get to the point that Israel did in the day of Amos. We owe it to generations that are yet unborn to preserve the simple truth of God. Now, I've got just a few minutes left. Are there any questions, comments, or snide remarks? That's supposed to be a joke. <laughs> Anything? I have a question. Yes? The difference between an, an expedient or truly an aid okay. and an addition. 
And an expedient is something which expedites. It makes it easier for something to take place. For example, a songbook, PowerPoint. That's an expedient. Why are you doing when you're using that and singing? You're still singing. It doesn't change what you're doing, does it? An expedient is something that speeds up, for lack of a better term, the doing of something. When you have the Lord's Supper, when you have individual cups, that's an expedient. Now, some people would say, no, 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 you've got to have one cup. Well, no, the Lord bound the cup, the content. He loosed the container in which the cup is in. Expedient expedites. An aid is something that doesn't change the nature of the thing that's being done. And so when we pray to God, uh, we can use a microphone to aid us in being heard, to amplify the voice. You're not changing what you're doing. Uh, aids and expedients are something that we can determine from a careful study of Scripture. And just because we think something is an aid doesn't make it an aid. That's the thing we've got to always remember about that. Any other questions, comment? Thank y'all for coming. I appreciate it. And if you want me to sign my autograph, I'll be glad to do it. You have a hundred dollar bill you can sign it on. I wish I did good. <laughs> and I promise to buy you. <laughs> oh. 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 I'm asking for something.